a pleasure today to kickstart the part of science that saw so much uh, failure or rethinking. <laughs> and I hope uh, that the talk will be more uh, have a feel of rethinking than, than failure, but you can, you can judge yourself. Um, see, the slides come. So I'm a postdoc in Rusty Gage's lab, and I'm um, working on human cell reprogramming right here. The, slides and uh, we are particularly interested in uh, Alzheimer's disease and specifically in, uh, in the context of uh, human cell aging. Um, so I probably don't really have to talk so much about Alzheimer's disease. Um, as you probably all know, it's a fatal neurodegenerative disorder. I think this one is not working. Here we go. It's a degenerative disorder of the brain. It's not really restricted to any certain brain region. Basically, it's affecting all, all regions. It's a, it's a loss of brain in the end. Um, and uh, it is the by far most uh, frequent dementia. And it's a growing problem uh, with the aging population, especially in industrial countries. But actually, all over the world, these cases increase and increase. So uh, we don't really have a solution yet to it. Uh, so we're doing uh, research. And I think for this, most of the research in the past has really focused on those familial AD cases, which, however, only uh, um, if are uh, like 2% of all cases. Familiar in this case means they are inherited mutations in genes that mostly affect the APP processing pathway into, uh, into A beta, while the vast majority of all cases uh, is actually of sporadic nature, which means that there are no known genetic reasons uh, for the disease to develop, uh, which of course makes it super difficult to study uh, the disease and transgenic animal models because we don't really know what to knock out, what to mutate. So it's a, actually a prime disease actually where we said, okay, this is a disease that we have to study in the human system, for example, by using new tools like human embryonic stem cells or human induced pluripotent and stem cells. Um, However, when we, when we think about Alzheimer's disease, especially sporadic Alzheimer's disease, we have to take into account that aging is the by far most significant risk factor, and we have to kind of be aware of, of what we're doing when we model the disease in the dish. Um, so we don't really know so much, so much about the biology of cellular aging. One thing we know for sure, it affects us all. Uh, nobody of us getting younger, everybody's just growing older, and this would not be a huge problem until we realize that aging is the most significant risk factor for not only Alzheimer's disease, but actually many diseases. Um, and uh, with some of these diseases, for example, AD seem to exclusively affect old people and never young people, which is, which is quite dramatic, uh, that some people would already come up and say, okay, Alzheimer's disease is not really a disease on its own, but it's just more severe brain aging. So some people age faster, some people age slower, and that's why some people get affected with Alzheimer's disease when they are 60 or 80, and some are okay till they are 100 years old. Um, so we still have very little understanding of the biology of aging and other age-related diseases, and we have no cure uh, that could stop, halt, or reverse progression of AD, of ALS, of Parkinson's disease, and so on. Uh, but uh, what we know that also in the healthy population that's not affected by a certain disease, the aging also leads to a decline in neuronal plasticity and cognitive performance, indicating that our little neurons that we have in the brain that we use um, are actually decaying over uh, our lifetime, uh, which actually kind of makes sense because the neurons uh, we're using are actually as old as we are as they are born during embryogenesis and early life. So the neurons you're using right now to think about what I'm saying are actually those tiny postmitotic cells that have to survive all your life and, and still work, uh, which is actually quite amazing because they can't really regenerate very much. Uh, so in case of AD and studying AD, we actually want to study this in, in aging human neurons. So if we want to look into uh, a person's brain representative in the dish, we want to know about the aging component. And this was one thing uh, we did in the past uh, where we looked at um, a cohort of uh, 90 healthy human individuals ranging from newborns up to 89 years of age uh, to get fibroblasts from those people and uh, reprogram these cells back into iPS cells as we usually do it using the four Yamanaka factors and uh, generate neurons to now compare what's different between neurons that we generate from young people versus uh, neurons that we generate from old, healthy people in this case. Uh, so we started by looking at this in an unbiased RNA-seq approach and first compared just young against old-derived human fibroblasts. 
And when we analyze for differential expression in the system, we actually see that there are many genes that are significantly differentially expressed by aging. So some genes apparently uh, get increased in fibroblasts, some decreased in fibroblasts as we grow older, which seems to be uh, kind of normal. However, when we now generate iPS cells from these young and old fibroblasts, there's actually no aging information left in the end. There's no significant differential expression in the fibroblast uh, in the iPS cells detectable, whether they were derived from young or very old people, uh, indicating that this e uh, iPS cell uh, reprogramming process actually rejuvenates all cells back into the embryonic state, which is actually what these iPS cells are. They resemble embryonic stem cells, the earliest time point of our development. So this is maybe not as surprising, but definitely a problem if we now want to use these uh, neurons that we generate from iPS cells to study a disease that's highly age-related. So to circumvent this problem, we used another method to generate functional human neurons in the dish, which is the direct conversion of fibroblasts into induced neurons, or IN, um, where uh, only two transcription factors, in our case, NGN2 and ASCL1, uh, with a cocktail of small molecular enhancers can quite efficiently directly convert a fibroblast into a neuron. This is without any stem cells, without embryo, without cell division. It goes directly from one fibroblast to one neuron. Uh, so this is how this looks in the dish. So we believe that these uh, two pioneer transcription factors, which we overexpress, uh, induce those morphological changes within the first one or two weeks in the cells, the first... Um, neuronal proteins become expressed. And I think what's really important here is that these pioneers also open the chromatin for secondarily expressed transcription factors, which then drive the real conversion into functional, uh, mature neuronal cultures within three to six weeks, typically, in culture. Uh, but most importantly, when we now generate these INs from young and old people's fibroblasts, we actually see that there's a bunch of genes that are significantly differentially regulated by age. Um, to make a long story short, I can't really go into detail in this time frame, but the uh, fibroblast aging genes that we see and the neuronal aging genes that we see, they don't really overlap very much. So there's a very tiny overlap. It's not really that these like, just get transferred. Actually, most of these genes get shut off. Uh, in the process, uh, with a fibroblast in the end showing a more skin-typic aging profile, like wound healing gene categories, while neurons show a more brain-typic aging profile. There's synaptic plasticity as a goal term. Uh, there's um, long-term potentiation and uh, calcium homeostasis, for example. So things that people saw before when they just looked at the aging brain. Uh, by microarrays. We also did some functional testings uh, in which I also don't want to really go in detail, but for example, we found that the nuclear pore, what are these pores that sit in the nuclear envelope, uh, become leaky uh, in old cells. This is both true for fibroblasts and for neurons, uh, and also see some uh, age-dependent mitochondrial phenotypes. Uh, but I want to like use the second half of my talk to uh, talk more about Alzheimer's disease uh, and, and using this model. So on the one side, you could say, okay, we have two findings here. Number one, INs are phenotypically old, while iPS cell derived, uh, derived neurons are phenotypically young. So we should study a disease like Alzheimer's disease in INs and not in iPS cell derived neurons. However, I think this is only the half story because I think the really unique uh, 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 opportunity that we have right now is actually to generate a human neuronal model system here that actually controls for age, as we can generate both old as well as young or rejuvenated cells uh, from the very same patients to actually see what this aging component is doing in Alzheimer's disease in the system. Uh, so we are establishing a human neuronal AD model that actually controls for age in the system to then look again first by RNA-seq and analyze for age-dependent AD gene expression as well as age-independent gene expression in these iPS cell-derived cells and compare this also to normal aging genes which we have determined before. So starting from a cohort of about 30 uh, patients and controls that we got in collaboration with the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at UCSD, uh, we, uh, we started this. They are all nicely, nicely phenotyped. We have a lot of clinical data also of the controls and first uh, looked into the fibroblast by RNA-seq again. And you might be not so surprised that uh, when we just do a differential expression for fibroblasts and compare AD against control cells, we see absolutely no significant differential expression, which is maybe a little bit sad that there's nothing, but I mean, uh, Alzheimer's disease is not primarily known to be a disease of the skin. Uh, and similar, when we look by principal component, it lo just looks mixed up uh, by PC1, PC2. There's no real uh, strong difference here. Uh, 
So we went forward and generated neurons uh, from, from these. Uh, so we saw first that all these cultures really nicely converted into neurons. They are all beta-3 tubulin and nu N positive. Um, the conversion rates are similar between uh, control and, uh, and Alzheimer, about 50%, which is very typical. Then for RNA-seq analysis, we first uh, fax isolate the cells and then look at their transcriptomes. And for now, I can show data from um, 11 patients and eight controls that we could derive so far in direct conversion, not iPS cells yet. And uh, this was quite surprising. Uh, that we saw, and we turned these very same fibroblasts that showed no difference at all into these neurons, we saw more than 900 genes to be highly significantly differentially expressed in the system with a p-adjusted value of 0 0.005, uh, indicating huge cha changes, huge differences in these neurons, uh, while these changes were not there in the fibroblast, and these are AD specific. And similarly, uh, in the principal component analysis, we even see a separation between these two populations uh, uh, with the control and the AD being actually really separated here, indicating really major differences in the transcriptomes and probably in the functionality of these cells, uh, something you would rather expect maybe for different cell types or slightly different cell types rather than like small phenotypes. I mean, the brains of Alzheimer patients are very different uh, to healthy brains, but this was, was quite a surprise and we are currently really working on like finding out what these uh, genes and gene categories tell us uh, uh, which experiments uh, to do to look at the uh, function. Um, so another thing I can cover here is uh, that we can also already look at the normal aging genes and compare those to the Alzheimer genes to actually get a hint at the question um, if AD looks more like severe aging or if it's, if it's something, uh, something different. And for now it looks like something very, very different. So it doesn't really look like these aging genes are more severely impaired in Alzheimer's disease. They basically look the same. Some go up, some go down. Most are not significant, but the others are that don't point in a certain direction. Uh, so, it, at least in this system, in the neuronal system, uh, AD uh, seems to be something else, uh, but we don't still know if this is um, dependent, oh, this was the wrong direction, if this is dependent on age, uh, so we're currently in the process of generating and analyzing RNA-seq data from these rejuvenated neurons as well to see if this really strong AD-specific um, uh, transcriptional profile actually withstands now the rejuvenation process to iPS cells or if it becomes erased together uh, with the aging component. Um, and I hope I can tell you next time a little bit more about those findings. Uh, so with this, I would like to end and thank everyone who was involved. First of all, Rusty Gage, who couldn't be here today. Lots of um, uh, very, very helpful uh, partners in the lab, but also uh, at UCSD, at the clinics, um, without whom this kind of project wouldn't be possible. And of course, the Paul G. Allen Foundation for enabling us to, to do this kind of project. And uh, you for listening. Uh, what is your thinking about <clears throat> what kind of neurons you're getting in either of the two cases out of the perhaps many, many thousands of distinct and diverse types of neurons? And in particular, since there's some evidence floating around that the induced neurons that come straight from fibroblasts carry a neural crest partial phenotype, sort of sensory autonomic or, or maybe not, whatever your thinking is, that's not thought to be involved in AD, so I'm wondering um, how you're, you're thinking about and addressing those issues about specificity, and is it maybe true, true, but not related, or something like that? Yeah, so um, we have characterized the neurons that we get with our method. They are like 80% glutamatergic cells uh, that seem to be to cluster closer to, to cortical cells in general. We see uh, different cortical markers of different cortical layers being expressed at different levels. So we think it's a mix there. And the remaining 20% are also mainly GABAergic cells. Um, so it's a mix in culture. It looks like general cortical. Uh, but, um, but there might be like specific rates of aging uh, which progress in different cell types. So for example, if you think about Parkinson's disease, which is a very disease that's very specific for certain brain regions for midbrain dopamine neurons, that those cells might age at a different rate in a different way to the cells that we are generating. So there might be other aging uh, uh, mechanisms involved in, in different diseases. However, I think when we look at um, Alzheimer's disease and we can generate something that's CNS, I think we are, we are already close to, to what we want to look at. Yeah. Can I ask a quick follow-up on that? So on those cortical layer markers that you know, you've identified many of those, they're, they're frequently
completely, totally non-specific outside of their normal context. So you've looked with multiple positive and multiple negatives to make sure they're not, for example, a CTIP2 positive neuron from some other part of the nervous system or something like that. So the thing we've not done is single cell in this case. Uh -huh. So I can't really, really say what proportion of it is. You see a certain expression level of, say, 100 counts over, like, per million or whatever. So you know it's somewhere in there, but you don't know if you have single cells that are highly expressing this highly or of it's a mix and everybody's expressing it at a at a certain threshold so uh, I can't really really say ab about this uh, very much yeah Great. sorry yeah so I, I'm interested in sort of pushing your where you're thinking about the role of age in this process so you've defined a, a group of look like 65 to 85 year old Alzheimer's patients right so it, but if, if you push your thinking earlier and later, I think you, there might be some really interesting biology going on, right? So uh, the newer clinical data suggests that there's really pronounced amyloid deposition in cognitively intact subjects in their 40s and 50 years of age. And most people think that that's the start of this disease process that what you're seeing is sort of the bitter end of. And so I think it would be very interesting to find out uh, what the changes are in those younger brains, right, but that are still undergoing this process versus the end stage. And on the other end, there's these populations of superagers, right, who are much, you know, who live into the late 90s and early 100s who are very resistant to these processes. And so to find out whether that is sort of your normal aging carried out just further or whether there's in fact a very different ph uh, phenotype of aging in those subjects versus a normal aging subject that confers some sort of resistance to this pathological process. I think that would be a really interesting extension of what you're doing right now in the conventional AD group. Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent point. I think on the one hand, when we have these um, rejuvenated neurons from IPS cells, it might be really interesting to look at those closer over time, maybe induce some accelerated aging in those cells to get at the earlier phenotypes. Because in the end, you might say, if, if you do age-equivalent INs, you might only, again, see the end stage of the disease, and you can as well just cut a, cut a patient's post-mortem brain and look what's going on. Uh, however, of course, we have, have more, more methods available to us if we have living cells. And the other thing, I think this is definitely something I, I want to do in the future, or once we get our hands on the Valdery population, say uh, those people you characterized as growing very old uh, with absolutely no signs of cognitive impairment, uh, and to compare those rates of aging, or at least the signature of aging we see there, to affected people, for example. So one one so quick last question. Yeah, I want to follow up with uh, a quick question on diversity. Um, so are your cohort of patients, are they a mix of familial and, um, and sporadic, one? And two, have you actually looked at the individual variability among the, the in, in gene expression among the neurons derived from one particular patient versus, say, the, the 15 others or whatever? Yeah, so um, first part of the question, yes, we do have some familiar cases in there. They're not being analyzed in the same group, so we're separating those. So the vast majority of cases we have is sporadic, and this is something we focus on. However, we always want to make sure that if or, or, or see if the familiar cases look similar or not, uh, especially in the functional phenotypes, for example, APP processing or tau phosphorylation. So, yeah, so I mean, it w would, would be really nice to just use this, uh, this timeline of aging that we got in the first, like, just healthy aging profile uh, project to uh, map or give a certain, like, biological age to each, to each sample. But I think the data wasn't, wasn't, it's not tight enough to actually predict the age. Like, for example, the methylome uh, data does. Uh, this is, has not been enough, enough samples to really uh, pinpoint the age of one sample or to have it predicted just on the RNA-seq data.